Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started now. Uh, we at USIP are really thrilled to have this virtual audience here today to listen and engage with this panel on women and youth participation in nonviolent action. My name is Matthew Siebel. I'm a researcher with USIP's Nonviolent Action Program, uh, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Uh, I'll say more about the panel's origins here in a minute, but to start, I'd like to first introduce our uh, four panelists. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Earl. Earl is a professor of sociology at the University of Arizona and a prolific expert in the social movements field, particularly regarding issues of movement repression. Uh, among many published works, her 2011 book, Digitally Enabled Social Change, explores uh, nonviolent activism in the internet age, and she's also written extensively on youth activism and political engagement. Uh, Marwa Loati, who is not here at the moment, but hopefully will be joining us soon, uh, is an international development professional and a Tunisian civil society activist. Uh, she has worked with the National Democratic Institute, the U.S. Institute of Peace, Democracy Reporting International, and the Council of Europe, among many others, as a senior project officer. Uh, Marwa is also a peace-building trainer in the African Coaching Network, where she works with social movements across the continent and is formerly the president of a We Youth Civic Organization in Tunisia. Isabella Picon is a Venezuelan activist and political scientist based in Caracas. Uh, she participated in the 2017 and 2019 nonviolent campaign for democracy in Venezuela uh, and is the co-founder of Lago Ciudadano, an organization and activist collective that promotes nonviolent action. Uh, she also recently earned a master's degree in political communication at LSE through a uh, Chapening scholarship. Lastly, Dr. Emily Henkin Ritter is an associate professor of political science at Vanderbilt University. Uh, her research examines the relationship between government repression and mobilized dissent activities, and her newer work focuses on the role of non government actors in the repressive process. Her book, Contentious Compliance, was published in 2019 with Oxford University Press. Thank you all for making time to share your expertise and wisdom with us. We're very grateful for the opportunity uh, to bring together this group of activists, academics, and policy practitioners. In one space. Okay, so moving forward, the panel will go as follows. I'll actually kick us off by introducing the project that motivated this panel and describing some research that my team at USIP has recently conducted uh, exploring women and youth participation in nonviolent action. Uh, after that, panelists will get the opportunity to respond to those findings, uh, and then we will shift to a moderated discussion, including audience Q&A in the later stages. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, you can type it into the window on the main event page online, which I will do my best to moderate here. I have it up on my other uh, window, and I will be. I will attempt to slot your questions in real time during the Q&A. Okay, so without further ado, uh, this panel is the culmination of a two-year research collaboration with USAID that explored the dynamics of contemporary nonviolent action campaigns. Uh, our research focused specifically on women and youth as two groups that often play vital roles in nonviolent campaigns, uh, but have not received as much attention as they we think they deserve in social movement scholarship. Uh, over the past two years, we've conducted a number of case studies, we've collected cross-national data on women and youth participation in nonviolent on action campaigns uh, that was in, collab with, in collaboration with Erica Chenoweth and Zoe Marks over at Harvard. Uh, and we've run some survey experiments to test whether women and youth respond to protest events differently or whether women and youth framing of protest movements matters for how observers perceive campaigns. Uh, and if you're curious to really dig into that research, you can find more detailed information about our findings online uh, in several recent or forthcoming report publications and website posts. They're either up on the website now or they will soon to be up. I think we're going to have another short piece up next week, and you can always reach out to me if you'd like uh, to see more of that. For now, I'll just summarize the top line results, which should serve as a launching point for today's conversation. So the biggest empirical finding from our work is that women and youth participation, uh, both of them are associated with movement success. So according to the cross-national data we've collected, movements with extensive uh, women and youth participation on the front lines of protest movements are, are more likely to succeed than movements with less prominent women and youth participation. Youth participation specifically uh, is also associated with improvements in democratic outcomes in the years following campaigns. Uh, and we think that these findings reinforce the importance of women and youth participation and also justify uh, policy efforts to better support these groups and their political engagement. Now, there are a lot of reasons why women and youth participation could be associated with movement success, and we try to dig into those mechanisms as well. 
data from our survey experiments shows that movements involving women uh, are perceived to be more likely to succeed and more deserving of popular support. So those movements might just be more popular. Uh, movements featuring extensive women's participation are also associated with less violence. Uh, and we think that this is largely due to the, what is known as the moral shield effect, which is that uh, it's harder for governments to violently repress women without triggering social backlash or massive popular backlash. And so they perhaps governments are more risk averse in this sense. Uh, in addition, younger activists are thought to be especially creative and also more willing to work across ideological or cultural lines, uh, which can help them to build broad and diverse uh, movement coalitions, which past research on nonviolent action tells us is really important to movement success, bringing in as uh, big a constituency as possible to the movement. So all that said, at the same time, women and youth participation is not associated with specific improvements to material quality of life for those groups. Uh, for instance, in our cross-national data collection, we don't find any evidence that youth participation improves youth unemployment uh, in the years after campaigns. And that's pretty striking because one of the major motivators for youth participation in politics that the literature identifies is youth bulges and exploding youth unemployment. So that's not getting better in the years after campaigns. Uh, we also know that both women and youth are often excluded from positions of political influence and leverage both during movements and the political transition periods that follow them. Uh, women have to contend with patriarchal societies and gender norms that leave them subordinate to men and kind of boxed out of politics, while younger people are told that they lack the experience or wisdom uh, of, of older generations and that they should defer to their elders or they're not taken seriously as political actors. So in short, uh, our research suggests that while women and youth are important for movement success, uh, it's not really clear that their participation is benefiting them as much as it could or as it should in the long run. Okay, so now I'm going to turn to our panelists to get their initial reaction to these findings. How, how do you feel about, about the, this summary? Do, do these findings resonate with your own work and personal experiences? And uh, in your opinions, what makes women and youth participation important to nonviolent action? And anyone can jump at that. Um, so I, I am really excited about these findings. I think they're really fascinating. I also think that they are um, uh, reflecting the fact that the more, the broader the coalitions are that are involved in a movement, the more likely they are to be successful. So individual groups, um, if we look only at uh, LGBT, LGBTQ uh, persons who are protesting for LGBTQ um, changes and making demands for their rights, and they're working alone, they're largely not successful, right? And that's what's being found in the work that you've done with uh, Chenna with Marks and Rivers. And, but when youth and women and men are working together towards a movement, um, towards a change, then they're more likely to be successful. So I think that the findings that are largely driving this is that when women are involved in a protest with others in a broader movement, that's a signal that the movement has really broad and diverse support and coalitional support. And those are the kinds of things that are more likely to be successful. Um, so for instance, in the US civil rights movement really took a turn in the United States when members of the dominant group, white persons joined black organizations for the fight for rights. And when black organizations were working on their own, they were less successful. Um, and in Iran, the protest movement started with demands for women's rights, but quickly turned into a critique of the repressive regime at large. And so it has become a movement with men and women and labor unions and lots of different uh, um, swaths of communities across Iran working together for change. So... Um, when women's when women though demand women's rights and they do so alone, they're rarely successful. And when youth are demanding rights for youth alone, they're rarely successful. So I think it's it makes a lot of sense that we're finding that when women are involved in larger movements and broad movements, they're more likely to be successful, but we're not seeing necessarily changes in the material benefits and policies for these marginalized groups because they're not success as successful when they're making demands um, on their own. Isabella, do you want to go next or shall I? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to point out that I think women, uh, I mean, my my perception is that, or, or when I started studying civil resistance and and and, it, in, and it started doing it because I became an activist, I I felt that that civil resistance studies were like excessively focused on products, on outcomes rather than process, and like how movements are uh, are built. And um, women are very, I mean, I don't want to essentialize because I, I think that's a problem, like essentializing that women are good for peace and are focused on, uh, for example, caring duties, et cetera. But, but many women are, are very good at curating spaces that sustain movements. And this makes movements more resilient. Like the way I became an activist was because my father was in prison and it was uh, that was this was in 2017 after like the four months of protest in Venezuela and I was very very depressed and I went to a, a meeting uh, sort of like an, a very small assembly that was near my house with some people that I knew some people that I knew were gonna be there and say mad uh, someone that I had done activism with sort of like took me on her arm and told me like asked me like how are you and like are you kind of ready to to come back to us and I was like mm, actually maybe I am you know and she exercised that role of how are you and the other her partner a, a guy was ba you know kind of basically organizing stuff and like doing the you know doing more I guess more operative work, but what Seymar did actually is was you know what actually added me into their numbers, and this meant that I was now participating again. So, so I think one of the reasons why why women are um, like essential for this for social movements is because the curation of spaces and the the like the sustaining processes of deliberation and are yeah they're they're like essential for that and and it's a work it's actually work that is not recognized and that not only women should do i mean the problem is one of the problems is that we think oh well women are doing that that's great so the guys should basically to do the spokesmanship and and we should write the minutes and they should uh run the meetings and it's like no actually what we are doing they should be doing too and we should be doing the spokesmanship and running the meetings too it's not like there should not be like this very clear gender rules it's just that we should be doing both things to sustain movements that's just how i wanted to like open up uh yeah well, Matthew, let me thank you for uh, both the work that you and your colleagues have done and also for hosting this event today. I've already enjoyed hearing from uh, Isabella and Emily. And I, I think that the research that you've done with your colleagues has really been important because young people are in practice venerating social movements. They're, they're innovating. So they're through and through social movements. Um, but people often don't notice them. Um, and scholars don't often notice them. Uh, and when they do, as you mentioned, they often notice them to say that this isn't for you, um, or you have to do it our way, or you don't know enough, um, instead of to notice the incredible amount of uh, innovation, the incredible amount of resilience, um, and the incredible impact that their participation has. So I really appreciate that you and your colleagues are helping to highlight the importance, both historically and contemporarily, of young people and women to nonviolent conflict, to social movements, because I think for too long, um, people have have ignored the role, particularly of young people in movements, um, and when they noticed it, complained about it, <laughs> as opposed to celebrated it. Um, and as academics really approached it the way um, 
uh, older people approach looking at many older people approach looking at younger people's actions like through our mindset. So we have concepts like biographical availability um, to explain the specialness of young people, which is that that young people have this incredible amount of free time. Maybe not the young people I know, but um, mm -hmm. they have this incredible amount of free time, and that's what's uh, special about them. And I think more and more scholarship and and the work that you and your colleagues are doing is i think helping to push this forward more and more scholarship is recognizing that that's not really uh probably capturing the full or most important impacts of young people's participation in movements um instead we really need to think about um what it means to have distinct interests from older movement members? What's it mean to be a, a young uh, Iranian woman versus an older Iranian woman? What's it mean to be um, a young Black woman versus uh, an older Black man in, uh, in Black Lives Matter? What's the unique interest that young people have? And then how do those interests the innovation, the uh, participation of young people, how does that help transform movements in more fundamental ways than they're biographically available or something? Um, and so I, I think that the work you're doing is really pushing that forward. I was saddened, although not surprised, I guess, to read um, that your research is showing that the payoffs of that participation are disproportionately lower for young people in terms of the rewards that they as a group receive for that. Um, not surprised in the sense that young people have been formally politically excluded. Um, uh, and when they're not formally politically excluded, are often face, you know, this heated criticism from friend and foe. And so it's not surprising that that their important contributions don't just get denigrated on the front end, they also get <laughs> diminished on the back end. Um, I hope that that your findings, though, point to a way that international actors and national social movements can focus on rectifying that, um, both then highlighting young people on the front end and also helping to reward that participation on the back end. Wonderful. Okay, this is there's a lot to chew on here. Um, I don't quite know which direction to go in, but here's here's the question I now want to ask after these uh, helpful introductory remarks. Uh, so I wanted to jump on something that Emily said about, uh, like, my question is about the relationship between women's issues and uh, kind of broader protest participation. So which which of these comes first? So uh, one of the findings that comes out of our research is that. Uh, women are often welcomed into social movements for regime change or democracy, big system level change, but then women face hostility when they attempt to build on that mobilization and advocate specifically for their, their, their own interests. But at the same time, it seems like sometimes protests that are initially about women's issues, like the, the, the Iranian example is really good, which protests that started around expressly women's issues that then snowballed into the, kind of this kind of bigger social movement. So what's going on? On there how how should we think about the relationship between gender specific protests and like how that fits in this with this broader kind of uh, civil society space um i feel like uh so i i wish i had a a, a direct answer for you like i wish i could say this is what comes first and this is why and this is how it works and i i honestly don't know that but um what i will say is that um I think it's related to the fact that there are multiple actors who are involved in repressive policies, right? So there's a government that makes policies that decides to use violence in the by using the military or the police um, and uh, decides what the, the framework or the structure of repression is going to be. And then there's society. right? And in particular, there are dominant actors in society that carry out the repressive policies in the structure that the government creates. And so um, when that societal actor, right, when, and so if we're talking about women, often when we're talking about the dominant group in society, we're talking about men or male identified persons. And so when, man, when men see a place that they can benefit, 
or um, here demands that they can broaden to their benefit, then they will do so. So they'll they'll do what happened in Iran. It's not necessarily, we can't conclude from the fact that there's this broad coalition and support that all of these people support women's rights, but they could take women's rights and turn it into a focus on the repressiveness of the regime at in, in, in large. And because the dominant group was so repressed as well, under is so repressed as well under the Iranian government, they're willing to do that. If they weren't also repressed, right, if they were benefiting from the structures that, um, that the women were protesting, then they'd be less likely to join them, right? And so I... I think that those are the kinds of, so we need to think not just about um, the government versus women. We need to think about government and the dominant group and women and how they relate to one, each other, one another, and in particular, how they relate to the demands that are being made. Isa, are you looking to add to that? You're unmuted. Just one. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just like... Just absorbing. Yes. Well, I, have, I, have a, I will direct it at you anyways, because I'm curious, um, you know, you, you had gotten it, uh, another question I have that's related about mm -hmm. kind of unique gender roles in protest movements. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're, you're describing, I think, uh, what, what I suspect is a relatively common struggle, uh, for women activists. Uh, and I'm just mm -hmm. curious how, how you like, how you see the way forward to navigate those issues, um, especially as they relate to then which which uh, which objectives or priorities these movements are focusing on. Yeah, um, I mean the the more time I spend in like activism and politics, the more I feel it. Like the more the, I mean the the higher in the echelon of decision making I go, uh, the more I feel it. I mean, if you are in a, I mean, I'm I'm gonna like explain the difference between what I was doing in 2017 and what I'm doing now. 2017, I had a tactical role. I was basically doing um, pancartas. Um, I was doing um, like painting stuff and like doing tactical things. And that place is a place of horizontal horizontality and camaraderie and it's beautiful. When you go into the strategy into, okay, what are we gonna prioritize today? What should we communicate? Um, uh, uh, what are, which organizations uh, should we ally with? Like right now, I'm trying to um, to connect uh, civil society organizations and political parties to join forces on like water issues or subway system or like that. Like our theory of change has to do with um, with causes with like uh, like building unity, but around certain causes rather than like top down. We need to have a grand strategy like uh from from the beginning because obviously the manual says that you need unity discipline and, and planning but it doesn't really work uh and like in practice uh, unity is not built like top down like that so the instances of strategy are very much male dominated it's uh, and the older I get, because I, I go higher in the echelon, the, the more you feel it. And the only way you can actually sort of um, build the strength to... Yeah, please. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, um, no. But I, 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 I like what you're saying about um, choosing you know, how do organizations choose the topic or the, the issue that they're mm -hmm. going to focus on? And I, I think there's, back to Matthew's point, I think that there's a really interesting thing to, to study here about how organizations choose that issue and to see whether it lasts after their success, right? So if you choose an issue that you can build a coalition around, does that mean that the coalition will stay together after they've had some success and they can then use that unity to um, make demands for their individual partners that are in mm -hmm. that coalition? And this mm -hmm. is something that I think is really interesting. Like 
choosing those issues influences what's going to happen in the next stage. And, mm-hmm. and it's, it's really hard to, to know what that, that influence mm-hmm. is going to be. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes there's a temptation of we were successful and okay, we go on to the next thing. And it's like, well, maybe not, not necessarily. Uh, but what I was saying is that you need to partner and to uh, have affinity groups with other women that are sort of in the same position or in in lower positions in the hierarchy to like support each other. So you are like, you know, um, this meeting, I'm just not going to write the minutes, you know, I'm just someone else is going to do it. And uh, or I'm not I'm I'm not gonna send the list of to do things. Someone else is gonna do it. Like and like you need uh, you need support from other women to sort of uh, survive and thrive in the in in the process, especially if you're in a strategic role. Because it happens a lot that women are basically doing social media, writing minutes, doing this care uh, the the care and and curating spaces duty and it doesn't mean we don't have to do it but we have to kind of teach men how to do it and tell them you know you you can you can probably do it too um but i think the only way is spaces where women support each other yeah. okay i'm i'm going to follow up on this again and hopefully bring some more uh youth focused mm-hmm. uh themes in as well so yeah. um Another kind of major change that has happened over the past 10, 15 years uh, with the uh, advent of digital media, the internet, really cheap cell communication, lots of contemporary movements now are really decentralized. Uh, Previously, movements had very clear, rigid hierarchies, not all of them, but this was more common. And now it seems like uh, potentially, especially younger activists are shifting towards more horizontal networks with consensus-based practices. How does that impact kind of these gender roles that you're talking about in social movements? Do you think that the kind of these practices are changing those if there's less clear hierarchies or is that not the case? Yeah, I think, I think it's changing. Um, um, I mean, I think that this affection, it has to do a little bit with the disaffection in general with political parties. Uh, so, I mean, I would, I would make a difference uh, or, or try to, to study like our young people in political parties as non-hierarchical as young people in like social movement and civil society organizations because sometimes the i mean the medium kind of uh that where you are kind of um affects the uh, the behavior. Um, so I've seen young people in political parties that are very much hierarchical and uh, older people that are very much into, like, they don't basically, they question any kind of leadership that there is, which is also very bad. Like, sometimes we go into the other extreme that it's like any leadership, any kind of leadership is suspicious. Um, but I would say that also, um, maybe young people are more into, uh, are more, um, into these tactical roles and precisely because of that, like in tactical roles, there's going to be more horizontality. Like if the, if the task is to, uh, to do a creative protest, then, you know, in a creative process, you need sort of horizontality, but in a strategic process, you need a few decision makers. So um, I'm a little bit skeptical of like young people are essentially um, like non-hierarchical or um, I, I don't know if, if that's exactly the case. But that's just me. I mean, yeah. So if I could jump in, I I mean, I would agree that I wouldn't want to essentialize the characteristics of either young people as a group because that's Mm -hmm. that's a difficult grouping. There are lots of different uh, intersectional identities amongst young people that make important differences, and I wouldn't want to essentialize those either. Um, Or 
women. But I think maybe a different way to come at this is to think about the, the position within uh, a political context that is leading people to be outside of organizations. Because the technology doesn't cause people to go outside of organizations. It allows them to. Those are two fundamentally different things. Um, people might have had an appetite to work outside of organizations long before there were digital and social media, but they didn't have the means to easily do so, um, to cheaply do so, to quickly do so. And so the technology itself doesn't lead to the appetite. It leads to an ability to realize that appetite. And so then I think the, the more fundamental question becomes, why would it be that young people or women want to work outside of those existing organizations. And the research that exists within social movement studies on young people certainly says that it's because those organizations haven't been very welcoming to young people. I mean, politics in general um, really treats young people uh, by telling them, this isn't for you, this isn't for you, this isn't for you. And then when young people reach voting age, say it's why aren't you voting? Why aren't you doing things? Why didn't you just act yeah. like your uh, political involvement was a light switch that went from you should know better than turning that on to it's on? <laughs> um, so we have this context where we give just tons of cultural and formal structural messages about how outside young people are. And then even our social movement organizations often repeat those same kinds of messages, really treating young people as though they're only going to be effective when they're working under the tutelage or mentorship or instruction um, of older activists, and often treating young people as labor as opposed to ideas people or strategic thinkers. So here's this preset thing that we've decided you should do. <laughs> now, what your contribution to this movement is to go and do the things that we've decided on. Who wants that? <laughs> no one ever was like, that's the most attractive offer ever to just think about taking my labor, but none yeah. of my ideas or what I think is important. And so I, I think what we see is uh, certainly changes in digital and social media matter because they're allowing these appetites to be expressed. But the appetites aren't being created by digital and social media mm -hmm. whole cloth. They're coming from the relative marginalization of young people's interests, ideas, um, deeper want for participation than acting as labor in movements, and also reflecting their deeper exclusion from political environments. Um, and so I think it's really the coupling of those two things that helps understand uh, us to understand why young people would choose more um, horizontal uh, and sort of routing around organizational pathways. Um, although I would agree with Isabella that that's not a totalizing fact. There are plenty of young people who um, are involved in, in more hierarchical movements as well. Um, I would say that the uh, apart from like being sort of marginalized, sometimes is the instrumentalization of uh, of young people. Uh, I mean, and it kind of triggered me a little bit when you, when like young people in the on the front lines because we live that. I mean, uh, in Venezuela, in like in 2014, 2017. Wow, um, so many young people on the front lines, but not really as spokespeople, um, basically on a labor, like putting their flesh and their blood there and willingly, like, you know, thinking that they were actually gonna, that we were actually gonna achieve democracy. I was, I was 27, uh, and I, uh, had I mean enough? I um, inhaled enough tear gas for for a, a lifetime, and willingly, like I really thought that that was gonna, you know, maybe change things. And uh, and th with these phrases like "you are the future of the country," "you are the one that needs to be here," etc., and that causes, I mean, 
in the same way that you're absolutely engaged at one point, then you get uh, allergy from like any kind of political engagement uh, because of the instrumentalization of your presence. And um, and now you see the, the lack of young people, like most of the diaspora are young people. 80% of the diaspora are between 18 and 50 years old. Most of them, uh, it, from 2017, most of them were between 20 and 35. Now it's gotten a little bit older, but you see like in, um, I, I can go to an activist meeting and be the younger person, the youngest person, and I'm 33. It's uh it's insane and that um that makes for lack of creativity for uh you know kind of not wanting to to make any really any real disruption etc. And what young people can do is because we can achieve some kind of disruption, we can sort of impose some rules of the game on how we're gonna make decisions. Uh, to uh, build a protest or build a, a strategy, etc. It's like we can create the disruption. We are the creative ones. Uh, we have the the discourse in a way. So you know you can you're gonna participate, but we're gonna put the rules here. And we have sort of started to do that uh, at home with certain causes. Okay, so I'm going to jump in here and because we're kind of circling indirectly around something that I want to mm -hmm. ask directly about. Um, so we often talk about generational gaps or generational uh, differences or kind of divides between, uh, hopefully without essentializing them, younger groups versus older groups. Uh, but we don't talk as much about specific strategies for how younger and older generations of activists can build big bridges and work together. Uh, and obviously, these comments are all, all related to this about how you feel marginalized and are not respected by older Older generations of activists. So I'm I'm just curious, are do you have kind of examples in mind of of cases in which this has worked well, or what are the kind of what are the conditions that that uh, civil society organizations need to to develop to try and better include younger people? This is for me, or you, anywhere? if you'd like, sure. Um. I mean, for example, we we organized a march on November 25th. Uh, uh, it was the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And uh, we, we wanted it to be like a, a women's march that was intersection, that was, uh, that was, that basically included um, young women and older women from popular areas of Caracas, because like violence against women, obviously everyone lives it, but like in in more vulnerable areas, it's 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 more acute. And uh, last year we, I mean, and there are many. I am a feminist, obviously, but um, sometimes uh, violence against women is sort of academicized, uh, and uh, we wanted women in in the barrios to like feel that this was their issue too so we kind of had to we kind of had to explain in a way to older women that are like you know the traditional feminist activists here at home that we needed to have a strategy to expand the participation so that women in the barrios that don't necessarily call themselves feminists would participate in this protest too. And that we were gonna, we, we well, I'm gonna actually share my screen. Um, here it is. That's my email, but uh, here. So we created this, protest where where we created uh um butterflies and uh, through like basically self mediation like they they would serve as pancartas as they would make um they would de uh, decorate their like you don't touch children you don't um you know they they would basically put whatever they want 
Um, and, and this is the organizing team. It's very like, you know, all, all of us in our thirties, this is very, you know, this is, this person is like 60, uh, see like 40, like people from different ages, people from different part political parties from like the left, the right, et cetera. And, um, and basically it was because the core group had a very, very intent and clear strategy, a clear symbol that was the, the butterflies. And, uh, because it represents freedom and transformation and, um, and that's how sort of we created cross ideological um, participation where women from different classes would participate in the march. Um, but we took some convincing of the like the older, more traditional activists, you know. So if I could jump in and add to this, I, I have a, a, my general answer is that we need to really think about allyship as a model for moving forward. Um, but I'll back into that by saying some things that often ruffle people's feathers a little bit when they first hear it, because they're not used to it being pitched this way. But I really think that we need to think about youth as a, an axis of inequality. Um, and intersectional youth identities as intersectional identities that are often associated with minoritization. Um, and so in the same way that we have worked across movements to try to make them more inclusive spaces, and we're certainly hearing from Isabella and Emily about the way that this is still very much a work in progress for women, um, we need to also think about trying to make spaces more inclusive for young people. And so I, I have like an easy uh, rule to suggest to people in their organizing, which is if you wouldn't say or do something <laughs> to another group of minoritized people, you shouldn't say or do those things with respect to young people. And so if you are, you know, for instance, hopefully unwilling to assume that uh, women as a group have completely consistent interests, that there's no differences amongst women of color from white women, women from different socioeconomic classes, women of different nationalities. If you're unwilling to accept that um, there, there aren't these, you know, if, you, if you're like in the moment now and, and like that, that was a tragedy for movements in the past to really think about things that way, we need to carry that vision um, of inclusivity into our relationships with young people. And so if you wouldn't assume that women um, or another minoritized group can't be effective unless you tutor them, right? <laughs> That's not a great look. <laughs> then you shouldn't make that assumption about young people either. If you assume that people are only good for their labor, not for their strategy, and you wouldn't do that, you would know better than to do that about another group, you shouldn't do it about young people either. Um, and so I think really the way to, to fix this is to really understand that this is a dimension of inequality. And that means that some of the same solutions that we've tried to have to other inequalities and in movements and in politics can work here too when we recognize this as an instance of inequality. And so when we start to really say, wait, um, if we think about it that way, that means that young people may have different interests than us. They, they may have different life experiences. They may have different positions and resources. They may have different networks. Um, th that opens up a way of really understanding how that difference can empower and improve movements as opposed to be ignored by them. Um, and I think that model of allyship uh, is the way forward. And we could talk about, you know, specific organizations that do that really well, but at the base, what those organizations that are doing things really well are doing is treating young people as people um, who come to movements with as much value and position and interest as everyone else coming to that movement. Um, and that once you get out of that hierarchical, unequal mindset, 
you can start to get to a more genuine place of collaboration. Oh, that was great. Okay. Um, ooh, way too much to, to, to follow up with. Um, I'm just going to take a, a second to remind uh, viewers that the Q&A is open on the event page where you registered. So if you have questions, we're starting to collect them. Uh, I will I will start looking at them shortly, but I'm going to ask uh, you use my uh, prerogatives and ask one more question, which is uh, one thing that our research uh, didn't really explore as I think as well as we would have liked uh, is uh, this issue of intersectionality, which has been brought up a, a couple different times uh, between gender and age identities. Um, so we know that youth and gender matter separately, as, as we've discussed, uh, but these identities can interact in important ways. Uh, and we, you know, we think that younger men and women versus older men and women face different opportunities uh, and constraints. I guess I'd like to hear from all of the panelists. Uh, I, I'd just like to hear more, really. Can you speak about this, how this intersectionality plays out in social movements? Um, you know, are there the kind of differences that have emerged across time? Are there, are there differences in digital space between younger and older men and women? Um, I'd really, however you want to take it. I mean, I would be happy for somebody else to go first if they'd like to, but I have some thoughts on it as well. Isabella, Emily, do either of you want to go first? Okay. So um, I think, you know, if if we sort of moving from my last answer to thinking about this as an instance of inequality um, or a kind of inequality, then you would immediately expect the kinds of double disadvantage um, that we see in other for other intersectional identities. Um, and that is what the research tends to suggest um, that, for instance, young women um, face even greater burdens than young men in being seen as agentic, um, as uh, able to provide more than their labor, as able to provide more skilled labor. <laughs> um, uh, and so uh, I think you you see those kinds of, of double disadvantage. Um, and so it's not surprising to me, going back to one of your earlier questions, Matthew, that we see young women stepping forward um, and uh, leading outside of traditional organizations. Like, let's think about, you know, Greta Thunberg not as a, as a sort of... Um, I mean, she is a unique person. I don't mean to say <laughs> anything like that, but instead of like having this like great leaders mentality about it, let's think about why was why is that person who's stepping outside a young woman? And my answer would be because the routes inside are relatively more forestalled for young women than young men. Um, and so uh, I think you know, my immediate answer is that there's this kind of double disadvantage, and that's really um, important to address and for us to be a, a aware of, not to sort of just treat all young people or all or women as if they're all one age. And I, and I think that, <clears throat> that there are differences across societies about how much of a double disadvantage that is, right? So um, if women... Um, become childbearing um, much earlier in some societies than in others, or if they go to college in some areas and not others, right? Those differences influence um, whether young women are going to have more power than older women um, or have the same amount of power, right? So there are some societies where I think that there's not as much of a double disadvantage as, as Jen describes, and there are other places where it's absolutely a double disadvantage. Um, so I think that, uh, yeah, that it's worth considering um, cultural context. Um, and in those kinds of contexts where there is a double disadvantage, um, it will it takes even more effort to um, bring in people who, um, uh, young women into the organizing and activism space. Uh, I see that Marwa has been able to join the call, which is great. Um, I would like to kind of ask uh, Isa and Marwa a follow-up question along these lines, which is, are these kind of uh, 
we've been talking a lot about gendered roles in activism or civil society organizations. Uh, and we've also talked a lot about how those are often imposed by older generations. Do you think that they're, the younger generations are different or do they exhibit the same types of kind of structured gender roles? Like we, we talked earlier about how uh, men are seen to be in like the big vision strategy positions and women are more like facilitators or curators of mm -hmm. spaces. Is that true for younger men and women as well? Hi, everyone. Sorry, I joined uh, late. I got confused with the time. Really sorry. Um, so for for I think that things are changing, especially in the Middle East and, and uh, North Africa in terms of uh, values, because uh, now we're seeing that the globalization has um, changed a lot of things in the mindsets of young people and the values uh, that they embody. So we see like more openness towards uh, gender equality and for women to embrace um, leadership positions and among young people. So even as, a, as, uh, as an activist, activist in civil society, I can say that mm -hmm. um, most most uh, organizations are women dominated rather than male dominated, and which is great. And the activism in, in Tunisia and in the Middle East, um, North Africa is also um, um, has been shaped by women's presence in, in the field. And they have contributed a lot in the fight for women's rights, especially, and also for minorities' rights. Uh, and uh, that's I think a great uh, way to uh, make um, gender equality not just a slogan, uh, but at least in uh, activism, we, we see it uh, broadly and we see it pervasively that the fight is on and also that uh, young people um, in general um, are calling for, for, for gender equality. And women are taking more of leadership roles. Um, for instance, in Tunisia, we've seen that uh, in the, um, in the, in the uh, constitutional uh, development, there has been a huge role. And one of the prize winners of the Nobel Prize winners was M M Mrs. Widad Bouchamewi. She was like the lady and she was uh, leading uh, the reform process. And she's also um, a great activist. When we see about the laws that have been shaped against uh, uh, the violence, uh, violence against women, a lot of the leading roles were uh, like women NGOs that were fighting for women's rights and also human rights more more broadly. And also in peace processes and mediation, uh, many of the facilitations that happen and happen in dialogue, whether at regional or national levels, they include. Um, uh, uh, both men and women, but we can see like things are uh, changing. At least, you know, I'm. I'm. I would be. I would say I like Tunisia um, has led uh, uh, a lot of uh, the changing perspective in the in the middle in the Middle East and North Africa, and has been set as an example. Uh, also see that there's still a lot to be to be to be changed in terms of um, making making uh, women's roles not only in civil society, but more importantly, in politics, we see that there is still this huge gap. I hope that covers the uh, points. Yeah, I, I think that uh, in Venezuela it's, and Latin America is the same. Like the civil society and sort of grassroots social movement sector is dominated by women, but it, when when it comes to like this the the speakership, uh, like the probably the running of meetings too, but like the speakership, the decision making, the actual coming into politics, uh, it it becomes, uh, I mean, uh, there's uh, a glass ceiling that that makes it so that we need to be very deliberate in, okay, we need to have these programs that sort of help women transition from this uh, civil society, social movement roles, so grassroots roles into, um, into political uh, leadership. Uh, and that requires training in, in 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 uh like 
giving speeches and and speaking in public uh training media training it requires like how to lead campaigns how to like management um and um yeah i think it's it has like i think globalization as marwa said and and there's a value change that makes women more like okay i could be in that role but the um the confidence and uh, the training that it requires for people to actually feel in like be comfortable in that uh i think it's very different like i i many uh, politicians friends of mine have taken what five or six courses on on giving speeches and uh, uh i mean women are usually not given that investment so that has to be done um sort of very much deliberately and it has to be done from 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 the start from when you are a social leader so that you are put in positions that make you think you know i could i could be up there in a more representative position Got it. Okay. I'm going to turn to some of the audience questions now. Uh, Erica Lee asks uh, about what what should we do in contexts where uh, access to either education or other resources are restricted? Uh, so where should women pull support from if, for example, women-led affinity groups are kind of met with violent repression or are uh, kind of excluded from, from political power or resources? How, how should women engage with that problem? process. I think I'm I'm the one that that mentioned women led affinity groups so I'm 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 going to to try to answer the question. I think first I think it's I mean yeah exactly uh, that's a good idea. I think affinity groups are very much like a private thing. So I've never heard of like an affinity group has been like targeted specifically. I, I think that we're access. Sorry, one second to read Wait. the question. Yeah, I'm going to read the question. Well, I think that's, uh, I think one of the last questions or one of the last talking points of this uh, panel, it was going to be like, how can the international community help external support? And I think, uh, I think external support can actually, should have, um, should help women affinity groups uh, sort of deal with emergencies, lead, uh, deal with um uh, with with moments where, where where when a woman needs needs help because of repression, et cetera. I think that's a really important area of of support for the international community. I one hundred percent agree with that. and and I think um this can also be a place where um courts and law can be really useful. Um, so one of the cases that I look at in uh, the paper that I've been writing on this topic is um is in Turkey. And in this case, women, I mean, I'm, we're looking at the case of femicide in Turkey. And there are nonprofit organizations around Turkey who can help women bring legal claims about um uh, against their oppressors or against the state for um engaging in femicide or supporting or allowing femicide. And in this particular case, this organization worked with international NGOs to bring a case to the European Court of Human Rights. So um, not only, I think, is it really important for international organizations, non-governmental organizations and governments to support women in these kinds of spaces where they have less local or domestic resources available to them, but we can also use things beyond uh, traditional protest actions and instead use things like legal claims to be able to, to pressure governments for change. Uh, 
I'm actually going to follow up on this uh, to, to get back to a question I'd wanted to ask Emily about an hour ago, and the conversation kind of wound its own way around it. Um, but this is now related. So, so uh, the, this initial question was about, um, you know, society in many societies in the world, women's access to to political power and influence is restricted. I think that's not that's not like a particularly unique context. Um, and that fact kind of it, it clashes with some of the stuff that our research shows in interesting ways. So lots of activists that we have spoken with talk about this moral shield effect by which uh, including women in protest movements uh, kind of reduces the violence overall, either for the moral shield effect reason because governments are less willing to repress them or perhaps because women are for some reason more predisposed to nonviolence and are better able to maintain nonviolent discipline in movements. Uh, that, that's a really common thread that comes out of our work. Uh, at the same time, you've kind of pointed out a couple of times here that uh, – you know, domestic resources for uh, for women might be really constrained. That societies find ways to repress women. So those those seem like their intention to me. Like how how can how can regimes get away not not be able to repress women in social movements, but find ways to systematically repress them kind of elsewhere? And I, I know you've done some work on this, so I would love to hear more about that from you. Um, there's a lot there to answer this question. Um, I, I think there are, are, are two things to think about. One is how um, social ideas of women or norms about women um, create this tension. And then there's also the process of repression that leads to this tension. So one in the first place, there are um, often in lots of different places, and in fact, probably in most places, there's, there's this norm that women are vulnerable, they're to be protected by by men, there's something that they, they are this group of people and individuals who need protection and should never be attacked, they should be supported, they should be, uh, you know, they we don't kill women because they are gentle and soft, right? And, um, and I think that that norm can be really cross-cutting. One, in that it creates this moral shield, as you described, right? Like that the police can't get away with shooting a bunch of women in, in an open field or in an open space. But at the same time, it undercuts the um, belief that women should have power or have rights, um, right? So if if society sees women under this norm of um, gentility or vulnerability, it can do serve them in this way of the moral shield, but also undermine um, whether they are perceived as being deserving of these kinds of rights and protections that they're asking for. I think there's also an element of, uh, there's a difference between the government responding to protests with violence and governments actually changing policies and practices, right? So governments might not shoot into the crowds if there are women there because they know there will be societal backlash, but they can easily get away with passing a policy five months later when people aren't paying attention anymore, that is a repressive policy. Or they might not shoot into the crowds and let the protest happen, but then not actually change anything. And that's especially likely if the, the dominant groups in society will uh, support the government in that, right? So they may not want them to shoot women, but they're perfectly happy not voting them into power, right? And so um, when they are, so I think, bearing in mind the distinction between that response and overall processes of oppression and repression um, is, is important for understanding that, that distinction that you found. Got it. Okay. Um, so uh, Shams in the uh, uh, audience chat asks a question about uh, kind of I, I, along the same lines of how to deal with repression, but the question is specifically about uh, education. So, and in Afghanistan, so uh, younger generations of women in Afghanistan are restricted, potentially even from basic educational opportunities. And I'm wondering if kind of this education problem is is specific and requires specific responses. So, what, uh, how should we think about lack of education? 
educational opportunities for women as a barrier to, to social movement participation? And, and you know, it, does that, I assume that extends beyond Afghanistan as a, as a context. Yeah. I I don't have a an answer to that situation, but I mean I I have an example of how we are dealing with that in at home. Um, I have a friend Daniela who actually was one of the organizers of the the march on the twenty fifth of November. She has groups of women teachers. I mean, and like the education system is especially up in the barrios is is pretty much. Um, non-existent so but there are women teachers that used to teach maybe 10 or 20 years ago in to, in public schools and uh, they have like in their homes they have uh their homes serve as as small schools so they create like a sort of cooperative of women teachers that teach each other how to teach and that also teach other women and because they go through a training uh, to like hone their teaching abilities and their you know and 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 to cope with the with the well with the fact that they actually have now the burden of teaching to and not only like um, cooking and and doing the caring of of their own homes they they go through this training and they create affinity groups so it's like and they become sort of activists also, I mean, in, in the area where they want. So I think to the extent that you provide education and to to women in these spaces, they don't have to be institutional spaces because we don't we know that the institutions are sort of like a, a zero, a non-factor, but to the extent that you can provide some institutions some some extra institutional education and uh, and also abilities to to teach to others you can create affinity groups of people that that eventually become activists too because they are not also they're not only caring anymore about the individual and like private needs but th they start caring about the community too and they start having the um some some skills to to be effective uh in the community So I don't think this is a, an, oh, sorry, please go ahead. I saw you on mute, please. That's okay. You go ahead first, sorry. Okay, so I was just gonna actually emphasize what Isabella said, like um, in contexts where there is a lot of uh, violence and threats of uh, police arrests, uh, I've, um, I think that homes and also historically, like through colonialism uh, and also when women didn't have as much rights as they do today in the world, homes were an important place where education and activism and preparations for tactics and for uh, strategies were taking place in informal settings at homes and home education is very important especially in places like Afghanistan now with the um, with the restrictions even on young young girls like going to 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 school so homeschooling has become very uh, crucial to ensure that um, the young girls continue to receive education education and not to uh, become uh, illiterate. And um, also women uh, uh, and homes in general, even when we talk about uh, people who are looked up, uh, looked up from the police, uh, homes are um, a refuge for for places to places where where uh, people can uh, can hide. And historically, this is where um, People in general have been uh, either hiding, educating, preparing for their activism and to, to fight police forces or to fight colonial forces and to avoid any any violent clashes um, in general. Uh, what is very important here is that, uh, especially with the uh, technological developments, that we utilize the platforms that are safe and secure for the communication um, if there is internet, of 
course, because now we live in a, also in a world where internet is not um, in place uh, or not doesn't exist everywhere in the same way. But whether there there is internet or not, I think um, humanity as a whole has been able to uh, implement and find develop tactics where it can. Uh, in secrecy, uh, continue to do the activism and does not stop just because there is a um, violent police forces or violent regime that oppresses people. The um, women women played historically a huge role and they will continue to lead uh, this role, whether it whether it be at homes or at institutional level. And we, I don't think that um, the world. Um, really understands or uh, fathoms the the importance that women played uh, over time uh, to make regime regime changes um, through uh, home activism as well. Just to sort of extend off that, I think instead of taking this question from my perspective as you know what to do. I could ask what has been done in the past. Um, and I think we could look at research by folks like Katie Pierce on former Soviet bloc nations. Uh, what, how did people resist um, in, uh, in Soviet times? Hank Johnston's work uh, is, is also on that topic. We have a lot of good work that is about how um, people have managed in highly securitized spaces that that have that have made potentially extended family and friendship networks parts of the surveillance apparatus how people resist and we just heard a, a great application of that work to to now um and uh we might also think about the ways that uh cultural groups and other kinds of uh, affinity groups that are more allowable become politicized, become spaces that are protected. So for instance, um, you know, language, language learning groups or language retention groups um, um, have historically become politicized and uh, been places where people can hold on to uh, resistance. But pivoting this in, in just one other direction, I think this really points to the importance of thinking about the multiple layers of control that young people, that women, that other minoritized groups face. Um, and because exactly the question that you posed that Emily uh, spoke to before about this juxtaposition of women being safer from immediate repression and yet being in really repressed by states. Um, Jessica Braithwaite and I have come out recently with a, a model for thinking about how you combine what's going on at the overall population and government level with what's happening to minoritized groups in a country, with what's happening in a political institutional space, with the control apparatus that's being focused on social movements. And our argument there is that literatures have treated these as things that are separable, but in practice, they are entirely inseparable for, uh, for getting a bigger picture understanding. And in part, the reason that they're inseparable is exactly the base of this question, because the answer is that if one area is stifled, <laughs> you move to another area. Um, and from a government's perspective or a repressor's perspective, when you can't do in one area, you do in another. Um, and that's the the sort of basis of, of the conversation that, that you and Emily Matthew had earlier. Got it. I'm just I'm just frantically taking notes down here with everything everybody said. Um, it's already 1117. So I think I'm going to cut us here. Thank you all again, very, very much for spending time with us. This has been really informative. And I have a, a lot to chew over as I kind of write up our final reports on the subject. Um, to the audience, thank you all very much for attending. And uh, we hope to see you again soon in an event like this. Thank you all very much. Thank you.